All right, welcome to week two. Um, as warned, this is a fairly lengthy um, slideshow. So instead of making your first lecture a long one, the second one ends up being a little extra long. Um, it's hello. So essentially, most of today is definitions and terminology and general concepts, which is part of what makes this so gross. Um, However, today's lecture should cover 90% of the terminology you need for database design. Anything past that, you can look up on Google or Stack Overflow, as if you're not already doing that. So for starters, we're going to talk about entities. Entities are the most basic unit in database design. And there's two terms, entity type and entity. And essentially, they mean the same thing. So depending on who you talk to, they're going to use the terms interchangeably. And essentially, an entity type or an entity represents a collection of data on things. And essentially, an entity is a thing. So people, places, things, events, that kind of stuff. That's what entities are. Um, so. If we talk about an entity being a person, now, when I say it's a person, I don't mean you as a person or you or, you know, her as a person. I'm talking the definition of a person. So essentially in here we have 90 persons. An entity instance is a single occurrence of a given type. So if we have a type in here called person or student, then each of you is an individual instance of that type. So in other words, if I define a student being a person's name and a student number, in here I will have 90 odd instances of a person's name and a matching student number. So that is an instance. So if a student is a type, a single student in the room, such as him, is an instance. If we're talking about people, I'm also an instance. If we're talking about students, I am not an instance. At least not at this point in my life. So now, with, now that I've defined basically what an entity is, which is basically a thing, there are two kinds of entities. There's the strong entity and a weak entity. A strong entity is an entity that doesn't depend on anything else. Such as, for example, a student would be a strong entity because you can uniquely identify it without needing any outside parameters to define it. So if your unique identifier is your student number and you have a name, the student number makes you uniquely identifiable. That makes you not dependent on anything else to exist. So if that piece of information or data is able to exist without needing an exterior source, it's considered a strong entity. It will always have a primary key of some sort. Or uh, sorry, a prime key, depending on who you're talking to, but a primary key and a prime key is essentially the same thing. And that means there's something that uniquely identifies that one piece. So each student here can be uniquely identified by your student number. So your student number makes you into strong entities. So if you have strong entities, of course we have to have weak entities. It depends on the existence of a strong entity. Now, I always like using this example and it usually causes somebody in the room to get upset, but that's okay. The weak entity is like that guy who can't live without his girlfriend. The girlfriend defines his existence. If he doesn't have a girlfriend, he has no existence. At least that's what he thinks. A w that's essentially the definition of a weak entity. But in the database world, a weak entity is a piece of data that cannot exist unless something else is defining it first. For example, using a student as a strong entity, your grades, individual grades, are weak entities because they cannot exist without a student attached to it. Right? Uh, basically, put you say, if I throw out number 87, what does 87 mean? Absolutely nothing, because there's no context. There's nothing that defines what it is and who it belongs to, what it belongs to. 
But, you know, if I say Bob 87, well, odds are that's Bob's current grade, 87. And at that point, it's still a weak entity because it can't be defined without Bob. Then usually what that means is it will have partial keys. In other words, it doesn't have a primary key of its own, but it, you can identify data in there based on what it inherits from the other people. In other words, 87 means nothing, but Bob 87 means it can be identified by being, you know, because of Bob. And it tends to use identifying relationships. I talk about those later. Um, but again, it, I actually almost described it already. Essentially, the, the object itself does not have a primary key of its own. It inherits identifiers from the parent. In other words, if Bob's student number is 0401234, and if I were to say the guy's got a grade is 0401234, grade is 87, it's, us it's using you know, a foreign key to identify itself, which I'm going to define later what a foreign key is, but essentially that's, it's using you know, the student's identifier to lock down what that 87 belongs to. Yeah? Metadata in what context? Not necessarily. Um, for example, as a student, you are derived from being a person, right? Outside of school, you still exist. Now, if you're a Canadian citizen, you have a SIN number. If you're an American citizen, you have an SSN. As a student coming here, before you put into the system, if you're a foreign exchange student, you probably have a passport number or a, um, a uh, student visa number. You know, you have some sort of identifying number that identifies you outside the school. Thus, they're both strong entities unto themselves. However, when you have a piece, an entity that can't, that cannot exist unless something else defines it, that's a weak entity. Um, for example, your receipts at Loblaws, you go buy some groceries. Those items you're paying for on the receipt cannot exist unless you've started a purchase. Once you've paid for it, it all belongs to you, but as you're scanning stuff on the self-scan and you're putting it in the bag, it's adding it to your order, those things are now yours. And at that point, but those entries on the receipt are weak entity without an actual, you know, transaction started. Does that make sense? All right. So, so far I've described entities, so things, students, rooms, teachers, they're all things. However, when we want to actually describe those things, that's where attributes come into the party. Attributes describe Entity slash entity types. And it should be cohesive to your data needs. Now there's a definition right there. When you see words like that on a slide, you know that's a definition. What that means is when you define an entity, any data you collect in regards to that entity should reflect to that entity. Even that sounds funny when I word it like that. So for example, let's talk about being a student. Let's define what, it, what is a student. As a group, we go student number, first name, last name, address where you're living, a phone number, maybe a SIN number or something else to identify, help identify you outside the system. Maybe, you know, your home address as opposed to your, currently, your current living address. These are all attributes that describe a student. Your, your score on Overwatch does not define you as a student. Therefore, it's not cohesive to a student. It might be cohesive to you as a gamer, but it's not cohesive to you as a student. So that's what I mean by cohesive data to the entity. In other words, if you're defining an entity, you don't want to collect all the data out there about it because it's, you know, useless information. I mean, for example, if we define this room, right, the things we could define in this room is, well, the room number, the number of potential seats in the room. Do we care what color the chairs are? The color of the chairs is relevant. Half the time the chairs are randomly moved from one room to the other. I mean, I've got at least four colors of chairs in here already, right? We don't care about that. That's not cohesive to the, to the purpose. 
So that's the difference between cohesive and not cohesive data. So when you define an entity, you start describing an entity, you stick to what actually is relevant. So cohesive could also mean relevant or relative to the data. Um, another example of of samples of data that would be cohesive would be um, the weather, for example. You know, cohesive information could be wind direction, wind speed, relative humidity, temperature, UV. But suddenly somebody goes out there and says, I don't feel happy today. Well, that's not relevant to the weather. That's just you. But, you know, mood. There you go. Let's go with mood. The mood is not relative to the weather. Who cares what your mood is? The weather is the weather. I mean, a temperature is an absolute. The wind direction is an abs mostly an absolute at that point in time. You know, when you take that reading, that was an absolute. It's north by northwest, blowing at 15 kilometers per hour. Congratulations. That is cohesive data to weather. The fact that you got out of bed and felt a little cranky today has nothing to do with the weather. Mood has nothing to do with weather. So with attributes, there's one more, there's a few levels with them. There's required and optional. So when you, for example, you start defining a student, because that's something you guys should understand, being a student. You should understand the data that applies to you as a student. For example, required information could be, and this will apply to the students from India and Bangladesh, First name and last name. As I've been, was informed recently, some of you don't have a last name, or at least not on your official government documents. So they put in your first name twice. Last summer, I had 12 students that had the same first and last name. It was lots of fun. I'd never got their name wrong. I just had to read one of the two. But as far as Algonquin is concerned, first name and last name are required. A telephone number is required. However, a cell phone number may not, is not required because, well, it's kind of hard to say that in this day and age, but there are people out there that don't have cell phones. So cell phone number is optional. Um, maybe your mailing address, the mailing address might be optional as opposed to your living address because maybe you live at home. Right? My daughter's coming to school. She walks from home. You know, she doesn't live in a separate apartment. Why would she go anywhere when she can eat for free? So, you know, that's optional. And for mailing address could be an optional data. But your current living address is required. Or they may flip it the other way, saying your mailing address is required, but where do you live? They don't care. One or the other. But that's the difference between optional versus required. Again, going back to attributes, there's simple versus composite. Now, a simple attribute is really easy to understand. It's an atomic piece of data. When you hear the phrase atomic, the word atomic used, anything has to do with database, that usually means that it can't be broken down. It's the smallest unit that is available. Yes, we know we can split things on the atomic scale. Usually things go boom. Uh, well, the problem is you can't split anything smaller than the atomic piece, so it doesn't go boom. It goes boom for different reasons. Um, usually because somebody, there's a chair keyboard interface issue. That's usually when things go boom. Also known as the human factor. So a simple attribute is a, an atomic piece of data. For example, a SIN number or a social insurance number or a social security number, passport number. Those are atomic pieces of data because you can't split it. It is complete unto itself. Your postal code is complete unto itself. Your date of birth, and the, here's usually I get one smart ass in the room that says, well, you can split data up into pieces, but technically your date of birth is one piece of information. Right? Yeah, there's a month, a year, and a day, but technically your date of birth is all three put together. Because you say, well, what's your date of birth? March 7th. What year? All years. No. That, therefore, date of, uh, your birth, date of birth is literally all three things put together. 
That is an atomic piece of data. It cannot be split because it's irrelevant if you break it down. A composite piece of data, on the other hand, would be something like an address. And this is a concept some people have a hard time grasping, that an address is composite. What makes up an address? You have a street address, a city, state, province, territorial, division of some sort, usually a postal code, unless you live in one of those tiny little countries where there's no postal codes. Usually even a country could be tacked on there for shits and giggles, you know, in case you're doing international mailing. And yes, there are countries where there's no postal codes. I had a student this summer that came from a country that didn't have postal codes. How was the mail delivered? You grabbed the mail for your neighbor and you dropped it off on your way home. They, he came from like a little island nation of population like 500. So it was kind of cool. Trying to make this explanation and he had a hard time grasping postal codes because he'd never seen them before. But an address, when somebody says, well, what's your address? Our brains automatically say, oh, that, it's this, right? One, two, three, some street, unit five, Ottawa, Ontario, K1Z, 1Z1. Wham, there's your piece of data. No, that's a composite piece of data. It's made up by multiple pieces of information. Street address one, street address two, city. No, political division. I like using that phrase. Because no matter what, you can't hit all the different ways of dividing a country. Then usually a, a postal code of some sort. That is a comp composite, uh, composite piece of data. Uh, that's the most common composite piece of data. Um, I usually have a hard time coming up with a second one, but there are, they do exist. You'll run into them in the wild, but that's the one that almost everybody understands. So when you're designing, the composite attributes can only exist at the conceptual and logical levels. So that means when you're initially doing the initial design, you can put down the word address. And you can say, oh, there you go. This you know, concept has an address. This you know, student has a home address and a mailing address. You can just put those words in there, and people know what they are. But once you go into the physical design, they must be broken down to their composite piece, component pieces. Therefore, at the physical level, there's no such thing as a composite piece of data. It is what it is. Now, there's one more kind of set of attributes, and there's single-valued versus multi-valued. Single-valued is easy to understand. Again, let's go back to date of birth. Anybody in here have more than one date of birth? No. You have one, and that's it. Um, you know, I, I've used other examples in the past, but the date of birth is one that most people understand. Um, I can't say anybody in here have more than one SIN number because that's happened too. Somebody had their identity stolen. They needed a new SIN number, but they still had their old one assigned to them. So they had two SIN numbers. So that wasn't as unique as I thought it was. So a single valued attribute is basically goes back to the atomic thing where a single value goes into that slot and there can only ever be one single value. Date of birth, SIN number, postal code, those are single values. A multi-valued list is a repeating group of values. For example, skills. So you want to list off what skills you have as a person or as an employee. And those would, you know, you could go, oh, he, is, he knows how to program in Python, in PHP, in C Sharp, he knows SQL, database design, you know, knows how to use Linux, BSD, you know, various forms of Unix, is comfortable in various IDEs, you know, th that's a set of skills. That's what they call a multi-value list. If you were to flip it away from computers and go to carpentry, you know, you could talk about how, you know, they know how to do certain kinds of joints. They are, they have their, um, their working at heights training. That's a skill. You know, you got your ha your women's training, training done. Technically, that could be a skill. Yes. A, a multi-valued attribute would be a list of classes. Um, well, a composite one would be, well, the composite one's stuff that's made up of multiple different kinds of data. A multi-valued is just straight up a list. So, for example, the classes you are taking would be a multi-valued attribute. 
Now for each of those classes, you could have a sub-multivalued attribute that covers the topics, right? So you now got multivalued inside of multivalued. So if you really want to start doing the inception thing, yes. Um, but technically, the list of classes you're taking is a multivalued list. Now, when it's time to go to, cons uh, to logical or physical, multivalued attributes are broken out into their own entity. Because there's no such thing as multiple values for a single field in a database. Or if you have that, you're doing something wrong. Uh, it's a big no-no. Um, so when you're creating a database and you want to list off the skills a person has, you don't want to put them all on a common delimited list because if you, let's say, they suddenly lose their qualification for one in the middle, you've got to read the whole thing, delete that piece, and rewrite the whole set of values. And then if you need to search inside that field across thousands of records, it's going to take forever to happen. So when you, part of the normalization process, which is breaking down the entities into seen units that make sense, you get rid of the multi-valued attributes and you turn them into their own entities. So they become basically parents. <coughs> now, stored versus derived attributes. There's two kinds of attributes. One is a real attribute and one's a virtual attribute. A stored attribute is an attribute that actually stores a value. Again, again date of birth. That is a real value. Well, as much as time is a real thing, it is a real value. You have one date of birth. End of story, it's a thing. A derived attribute is something that can be calculated. So if you can express the value as a mathematical function, then it's a derived attribute. For example, your age is derived. You don't need to store a person's age because you can figure it out now minus date of birth equals how old you are, right? It's math. Same thing if we talk about uh, groceries. Give me a second, I'm gonna go shut my door. Should I be passive aggressive? So if you ever see a teacher slamming doors like that, that they're being passive aggressive. They're telling you to shut up <laughs> nicely. Um, all right, so another example of a derived attribute is a look at your grocery store receipt. Anybody want to take a guess what the derived attributes on there could be? Eh? I heard a voice there. Yeah, derived. The, 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 actually, hang on, the cost? Uh, what, what do you mean by cost? Okay, total, yes, price, no. Whoever said price over there? Taxes is derived because it's mathematical function. No, that's calculated, dude. Well, actually, that's calculated. Technically, yes, it's stored because they actually store it. They calculate and then they apply it to your account directly as a single transaction. That one goes in whole. My, uh, my wife's... Um, isn't the PC optimum plan. I know exactly what the database looks like. I went for a visit. <laughs> no, that, there. The t no, he said total points, period. All right, could have acquired. They don't show you that anymore. No. They only show you what you got. They could have acquired is at Shoppers. And it's bull, by the way. Exactly. It's actually a fictional number. They just look at it and say, oh, they spent about 55 bucks and there was a couple of offers. Ah, you could, they could have had 50,000 points on their $10 transaction, which is 50 bucks. But there was another hand over here. Mm, up there. Parts of it are and parts of it aren't. But so, so, you know, inside of, a, inside of a grocery store system, what you see on the receipt will be a few things. You'll see the UPC code or the barcode number, a description, and the unit price. 
That is stored for every transaction. And the other thing they store is the quantity. Whether the quantity is the number you bought or the weight. That's where I'm headed. So you've got... No, no, the UPC code is the barcode on the back that you go beep. No, no. Well, well yeah, it is, but that, that's not how... It, that the grocery store stores the numbers. The, the, no, the number at the end is a checksum. It's just a piece of math that says this is a valid barcode or not. Um, yeah, with where I work during the day, we wrote barcoding software too, so I happen to know how that works too. On the inside, it sucks. Take my word for it, it's a terrible thing. Um, but for example, you got a barcode and you go beep. Now, the grocery store's database system has that barcode stored as a number. It has a short description of whatever it is. And it might not be a barcode, it could be a UPC code, which is, you know, 4011. What's 4011? There we go. At least one person in here knows what 40. 4539 is Gala Apples. Don't ask how come I remember. It's just a thing. It happens. Um, but, you know, those codes are universal. Every store has the same codes in their system. They may have a slightly different description, right? So 401, they'll have bulk bananas or just bananas or, you know, PC bananas, insert bananas here. And then the next number you'll see in your receipt is another stored attribute, price per unit. And then there's another stored attribute, quantity. The quantity could be, you know, so much each. So for example, you go buy a box of craft dinner I don't even know how much it sells anymore because that stuff is crappy. But, you know, a buck thirty-nine a box. Annie's is so much better. You know, but buck thirty-nine a box. So if you put three, here comes your derived attribute. Three times a buck thirty-nine is whatever that number is. That is derived. On small stores, they don't store that number. Why? Because you can recalculate it every single time. Now, the other derived value is your subtotal. So you take all what you call the extended price, which is price times quantity is your extended price. Add up all your extended prices, you'll have a subtotal. Then you take that subtotal, because subtotal is still a derived value. Calculate the taxes. And by the way, you store the percentage of the tax with the transaction, because taxes change. But you store the percentage, not the actual value. So, you know, so let's say your grocery total was 40 bucks. And, you know, 10 bucks of that was taxable because you bought junk food. They apply 13% to $10. So a buck 30, so you take the $10 plus the buck 30. Oh, so far, all this is calculated. Add them up. You now have $11.30. Ta-da. There's your grocery bill for the day. That is all derived. If you can express it as a mathematical equation, it's derived. If it's the pieces you use for the mathematical equation, that's not necessarily, that could be derived or not, depending on where you are in the process. So the ticket is derived attributes usually only exist at the conceptual and the logical stage. When you go to physical, you try to get rid of as many of them as possible, but sometimes you include them for performance because math is expensive. Although, you know, if you're like a little mom and pop shop and you're just selling, let's say you do a thousand transactions a day, there's not a single computer in this room that's going to break a sweat calculating your daily totals. Right? I mean, honestly, selling 10 things 1,000 times, your computer will do that before you even have time to blink. On the other hand, your law laws, Walmart, or the granddaddy of them all, Amazon. They actually store all the derived attributes because they don't want to do the math again. Calculate the math at checkout. They store all the values so they don't have to do the math a second time. So the only time you keep the derived attributes is for performance reasons. So for example, do you think Reddit stores your cake day? It doesn't store your cake day. It calculates it every single time. Every day you go in, it calculates what your cake day is. It's your anniversary of signing up at Reddit. So you know when you go to Reddit and you see a little cake next to somebody's name? That's because that's their anniversary of when they signed up. In case you're curious. Apparently you don't spend as much time as Reddit on Reddit as I do. Great. So, for example, 
your cake day is derived, but the sign up date is not. So that's, you know, the difference there. All right, so we're now going to start transitioning into the next set of topics. There are one, there's one last kind of attribute, and that is an identifier. An attribute that is an identifier is also known as a key. It is something that makes that particular instance unique. Here in the school, what makes each of you unique from each other? Your student number. Your, eh? No. Holy cow. And I'm not going to, got to be careful when I say this. Do you know how many Muhammad Muhammads I've had in my class? How many Patels I've had in my class? You'll be surprised on this one. How many John Macintoshes I've had in my class? Believe it or not, that's a pretty damn common name. Your name is not unique. Unless your parents decide to be really special and spelled your name so that it reads that the na your name might be Lem Lemongeli, but it's, it's spelled like Lemon Jelly. You know, unless they really got creative with how they spelt your name, your name is not going to be unique. Your student number is unique. And we can't even use, say your SID number or your passport number is unique because I've seen that happen before where I said, you know, I, I used to use passport numbers as a fairly safe and unique thing until one day I had two students that actually had the same passport number. Two different countries. Your fingerprint would be, your biometric data is usually fairly unique, um, but the school shouldn't be taking your fingerprints. <laughs> oh yeah, no doubt, or your iris, or your DNA, you know. There you go, I can get into class today. You know, there's different ways of treating uniqueness, but that actually, believe it or not, your fingerprint is lots of pieces of data, not one piece of data. It actually, it actually calculates all the splines that make up your fingerprint, so it's a lot of math. That's why fingerprints are not. You know, as fast as the fingerprint reader is on your laptop, you know, 15 years ago, it used to take a long time for your fingerprint reader to unlock your laptop or your phone light out. It's like, oh, oh, that's my latest Snapchat. Yay. No, lock it back up. Yeah, fingerprints, yes, they're unique, but they're not very useful in the context of being a student. So at the school, you have a student number. That's your unique identifier. As a Canadian citizen, normally your SIN number is usually pretty safe as a unique identifier. Or if you're an American, your social security number, or if you're in England, it's your national identity number, and insert whatever the heck it is where you come from. Everybody's got different words for the same thing. Yes. Your username ends up being unique, yes, because we can't have the same username twice. So if you've noticed, it's four letters and a bunch of numbers, right? And did you know those numbers means you're the X num person to have the same first four letters of your last name? You didn't know that. So for example, you got your last name H-E-L-D and then there's a number. So you're the sixth H-E-L-D here. My daughter, having a last name of McIsaac, M-A-C-I, which covers all the McIsaacs, the McIntyres, and the, you know, Macintoshes, and the, you know, all the Macs out there. I, I, she's actually got a, f she's got, um, she's at the, like, the 900 range. So she's about to spill over into the next digit. It's the first time, like, I think the, the Mac eyes are going to be the first ones to fill, uh, spill over. Go figure. Yes. The what? Oh. They just stick a number at the end. So, for example, we have eight letters and numbers just like you guys, right? Mine's G-A-U-D-R-E-D. -E and if there was another person with the same letters, they get G-A-U-D-R-E-1. They lose one letter. So you're a zero, zero, 001? No, uh, mine's just uh, like my last name. Yep, that's right. Yeah, you're the first with that combination. Staff numbers are a lot smaller, though. And so that is a key. It's something that's used to uniquely identify you. 
And your username just so happens to be unique because they don't have a choice but make it unique. Imagine if you went to log into uh, Brightspace and you type in your, you know, blah, 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 and you have the same email address as someone else and you get, you get to look at somebody else's courses. Or even better, you know, you log into Access and you get to see somebody else's grades or see how much they owe or pretend to pay their bill with a bad check, you know. Stuff like that. There's things you could do. It's fun. Uh, you know, messing around for chaos and fun. But that's why the username is unique, because it has to be unique. There's no choice. It's just how it is. Um, actually, to give you exa an example of email that is not always unique, how many of you have a Gmail account? Did you know Google is kind of weird? I get mail from some Daniel Goudreau in Quebec all the time. And his email address is literally Daniel Goudreau without the dot. And I still get his emails. And once in a while, Gmail says, oh, somebody made a typo, and they send me there his emails. I have actually emailed the guy saying, dude, change your email address. I've had mine since like, I got, like, I was, like, you know, one of the first invitees for Gmail. I've had mine longer than you. Go change your, uh, apparently the last time I did it, he got the message. Because he, I stopped getting his message. I mean, I've, I've gotten his hotel bookings, flight confirmation. It's great. So, if, yeah, unless you've got a really unique Gmail account, you might be getting somebody else's email occasionally. Um, it's not a typo. I thought it was a typo the first time. After three years, it wasn't a typo anymore. I figured out what, what it was doing. So. so, back to keys. Keys are made up of more, one or more attributes. You, it, sometimes, you'll have a combination of attributes that make you unique. We try to avoid that as, human, as much as possible because it's just rough to work with. Um, one thing that used to be really common was, um, believe it or not, at IKEA. They used to be have a code for the product and another code for the color. Right? You know, you can get your hot, hot, hot table in gray, in green, in white, and blue. I'm making fun of that. My daughter works at IKEA and she can actually say the words properly. I can't, so I just gargle them every time. It makes her mad. It's fun. And I take, you know, but it used to be, nowadays it's just one code, so it identifies the product and the color as a single code. But way back in the day, I remember going to Ikea and they actually had, each product was identified by two pieces of information. That's known as a compound key. You cannot identify a unique piece of information without having both of those. You could identify that this code identified all the tables, but you couldn't pick out the exact table you want unless you knew the color code also. So if you need more than one thing to uniquely identify an instance of data, that's known as a composite key. As a database designer, we try to avoid that as much as humanly possible because they're difficult to deal with. If you need to change something, you need to know two pieces of information. Here at the college, for example, if we need to change something about you, we just need to know your student number. We don't even need your whole student number. We need everything after the 040. Congratulations. Then that is literally your student number. And that's all we need to find you. The, by the same token, um, you know, if we needed to add one more piece of information, that's your student number plus, say, your SIN number to identify you. That's a composite. And if suddenly your identity got stolen, you need to change your SIN number, yes, you've got to crawl through and start changing all these identifiers. It's not good. All right, so continuing on with keys. A composite key is a key that contains two or more attributes, as I just finished describing. Candidate keys are keys that could, that could be used to uniquely identify each row in a relation. So when we first start designing a database, we start thinking about what could we use to uniquely identify blah, this piece of this thing. You know, what could we use to uniquely identify that one thing? For example, I could use this mouse. You know, I'm looking at mice and going, what could I use to uniquely identify this mouse? And you look around, you know, you look at your mice and you go, well, I don't know what I could use to identify it. And I just found out that I was going to use my mouse as an example, but it's a piece of crap from China. It doesn't have a serial number. <laughs> 
I never noticed it didn't have a serial number until now. So no serial number. So obviously for this, I can't use a serial number to uniquely identify it. But for those of you that actually have a quality mouse, if you flip it, there's probably a serial number under your mouse. That would you, you could use a serial number as a unique identifier for a, de for a device. Now you got a serial number, right? Not a shitty mouse. I bet you didn't pay $5.99 for it. Bluetooth, $5.99. <laughs> you know. But, yeah, so I was going to use that as a serial number. That doesn't, that's no good. <laughs> that doesn't have a serial number either. Can you tell where I shop for my equipment? <laughs> If I were to flip my laptop, there's a serial number. Actually, no, uh, Lenovo hides the serial numbers under the, inside the case now on their laptops. Um, but anyways, if you look at the device, you, could, you start thinking, oh, what could I use to uniquely identify this? Serial number. If you think about people, you know, we start thinking about national identity numbers, such as SIN numbers or SSN numbers or NINs, depending where you come from in the world. Those are what they call a candidate key. These are things saying, I think I could use that as a, as a, as a unique identifier. So during the design process, it's known as a candidate key. In other words, you haven't finalized on that yet, but you think that will probably work to uniquely identify something. It's a candidate key. A primary key is the candidate key that gets chosen at the end. So when you're doing an initial design, you might have more than one candidate key. So then after you've done your design process, and you've, you know, you've settled down, you may just decide, hey, look at this. The combination of SIN number plus something else works really good to uniquely identify something. So I'll create a primary key made out of two candidate keys. Or I may decide for this particular database, the serial number of the devices is adequate as a primary key. So it'll be a single key. But up till the point where you finally decide, yes, this is the one we're going to use going forward forever, it's a candidate key. Once you've picked it, it's a primary key. So. What's the difference between the two? Technically, they do the same job. But it's where they are in the design process that's the difference. Right? You can look at it and say, oh, I think this is going to be a good way to choose. Once you've made it, that's how we're going to pick it, and that's how we're going forward. So once you're, you've made a final decision, it becomes a primary key. Continuing on with identifiers. When you're choosing your candidate keys, also known as identifying keys, also known as prime keys. They all become primary keys at some point. You want to choose things that will not change in value. Date of birth shouldn't change in value, ever, unless someone was lying to you. Hey, stranger things have been known to happen. You also have to make sure it's things that are will not be null. Now, by not null means it has to have a value. For example, date of birth is a great example of something that can't be null. As last I heard, it's impossible to be a living, breathing human without a date of birth. You came out at some point in time. That's your point in time. That is something that can, that's undeniably true as a human. You were put on this earth at some point. And that is something that is not ever null. You can't, for example, last name is no good because there's parts of the world where people don't always have last names. You can't necessarily use a phone number because I've actually known someone that didn't have a phone, period. No, they didn't wear a tinfoil hat. They just happened to be living out of their car for a while. But they didn't actually have a phone number during that period in their life. Therefore, phone number might be null. So, it's a fairly straightforward concept. Um, something that's static forever and that is required. You should avoid intelligent identifiers. Intelligent identifiers is actually a misnomer. Actually, it should be called the stupid identifier. These are things that could change. For example, your postal code should never be used as an identifier. Now, how many of you have had more than one postal code in your life? Congratulations, most of you, except for those of you that are still living in your mother's basement. You know, maybe they've been there for their whole life. 
But, you know, that's an exception to the rule pretty much by uh, nowadays. Most people move at least once in their life by the time they're 21. It is what it is. Uh, those of you from out of town, definitely you have a different postal code. Those who are from another country, your postal code sure as hell changed. Right? It's changing as you go. That's an intelligent identifier. In other words, it's, you're trying to use a real-world piece of data to identify something that may change. You're saying, okay, well, we'll use your address as your, your identifier again. I've had eight addresses in my life. You know, most of them changed before I was 21. I lived in my town. I went to college. I lived in two different apartments. And I lived somewhere else while I was working. Then I moved to Ottawa. Then I moved again inside of Ottawa. Then there's my home address, my original where I started out originally. If you want to go with that argument, the cottage where I lived half my life, you know, I've had nine addresses in my life, and I don't feel like I moved around very much. Addresses suck. You can't use that as identifiers. Therefore, avoid using what they call intelligent identifiers. In other words, an identifier made up of real-world data that might change. Some people say, well, we can use part of the composite key. Oh, we're going to use their name and their postal code, and then they move. How are you going to fix that in the future? Or did you ever have the case of you go to call up an old, an old service you were signed up with for years after you look at your credit card and you realize you're still being billed two ninety nine for whatever reason years later? And you call them up and they go, what's your phone number? 613-555-1212. That's not what we have on file. Oh, boy. Now you've got to try to remember your phone number from three times back. By the way, credit card companies are really bad for using phone numbers that way. That's an intelligent identifier. Personally, I, I, I wish I could just substitute that with the word stupid identifier because it's just stupid to use them. And the other thing you should do is you should try to use the simplest key as possible. The bigger the key, the harder it is to maintain. Therefore, substitute new simple keys for long composite keys. And I'll be explaining in a few minutes what you can do to handle that. Well, actually, in a few minutes, as in in a few seconds. I forgot that was the next slide. Surrogate keys. Surrogate keys are also known as synthetic keys. It is a column that has a unique identifier, unique value inside of it, that is a defined by the database server. So the database server assigns a value, and that value is immutable. It has no real world value. It's safe because the row gets created, it gets a new value. For example, how do you think you get a student number? Odds, uh, I've had cases where I had students in the class that actually had back-to-back -back student numbers because they actually literally signed up one after the other. You know, one person was 5'7", the other one was 5'8". Your student number is generated by the database server. I hope. And it increments. And once the value has been assigned, it can never be given out a second time. This is a really loud hallway, eh? Nursing students. Nah, they were too far away. You shouldn't piss off nurses. They're crazy. So, unique values are assigned by the server. Usually it's a sequence. In other words, it goes one, two, three, four, five. Once I give you number three, three can never be given out a second time. Other database servers, such as Microsoft SQL Server, tends to use what's called a guide ID, a globally unique identifier. It's this big, long set of alpha, uh, hexadecimal numbers. Uh, if anybody here has ever opened up their registry in their computer, not Mac users, because you don't have one, but if ever you've opened up the registry in your computer, you'll scroll through and you'll see all these guide IDs in there. They're unique identifiers. They're technically uniquely, they're unique across the world. One time. Or they're unique based on whatever the circumstances may be. Surrogate keys tend to be short. Usually it's an integer. Why an integer? Because they're simple. One, two, 555. They're simple. They don't take up a lot of room. Computers know how to deal with them really quickly. And honestly, 
you know, we can play the uh, guess the number game, and you should be able to guess and a given number between 1 and 100 in less than five guesses. Well, six guesses. Because you can subdivide it. Because it's numbers, you can split. Numbers are easy to work with. Which brings us to the point of a surrogate key is ideal as a primary key because it has, it's self-contained, controlled by the server, has nothing to do with what's happening outside the server ever. And later on, I explain some of the other impacts of this. Yes? It depends on the machine. The random ones are dangerous because after you generate the random one, you have to go ask the database, does this already exist? And then you generate another one, does this exist? When there's only, you know, a thousand records, it would be pretty quick. When you start hitting a million records, you'll start getting... Uh, Intersecting conf conflicting values, intersecting values on a regular basis. So most systems use an incrementing sequence. One, two, three, four. Once three is given out, it never gets given out again. So, you know, that's what you use. It goes up, and if something gets deleted, even if three existed at one point and gets deleted, three never gets to exist ever again. Uh, it's just too much work to reuse past keys. It's practically, yes, it just depends on what size of integer you choose to use. The, 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 the performance gains are negligible. You might as well use the biggest one possible right off the bat, because if for some unknown reason your little magical database was a great idea and it just explodes. I don't mean explode as in boom, as in it explodes as in somebody you're raking in tons of money. You may want the bigger keys. So just design for big. Um, you know, uh, later on I do talk about some of the data types when I do the physical design side of the deal. And let's just say the big integers in Postgres, I don't know what that number is. Like I, I stop understanding once I get past like quadrillion. Whatever's after that, you can keep going another four magnitudes of size. So, you know. So, I'll be cutting back to sorted keys in a bit. But foreign keys. Foreign keys are an attribute. Yay. It is the key of one of the other relations that appears. For example, let's go back to Bob. Remember I was talking about Bob earlier? Bob with the 87? And Bob's student number was 0401234, because, you know, I made that up. But that's Bob, right? Now, Bob's primary key in, in his student record would be 001234. On the other hand, when I store 0101234 with a grade of 87, the 0401234 is a foreign key. That value is inherited, not like in Java, but it's inherited from the parent record. So the value of a foreign key is defined by the value of a primary key in another entity. Later on when you start playing with data, that, that, that statement will make more sense. But it, as a student, this is fairly easy for you guys to understand in this sense. For example, each term, every course, section has a unique identifier. I don't know what it is, you don't know what it is, but 19F, CST8215, section, what is this, 310? Three, no, 330. I was teaching 310 in the summer, still a little 310 mode here. 8215 underscore 330. That's this section for 8215, 19 fall. Great. By the way, they're using a smart identifier on that. And there's your, you know, but behind the scenes, that could be 52,356. We don't know. But there's a unique identifier back there. Now, as a student, you also have your unique identifier, 040, whatever, a bunch of numbers. Now, when you get assigned to a course section, they're going to create a weak entity, because it can't exist without its girlfriend or boyfriend, which happens to be a, the student and the section. This record in there will have... 040, a bunch of numbers, and then, you know, 52,000 and change, which would identify the section. 
those are foreign keys. Or if you're using it, something a little simpler, you've got an address, right? So you've got your personal record, you've got an address. And just let's just say you want to make sure that people aren't stupid and they don't type stupid things into your database. So you make sure the country is a drop down because you don't let people type shit in unless they have to. You've got a drop down. And although it says Canada or United States, in the database, it'll be a number, then Canada. Four, Canada. Five, United States. Six, United Kingdom. You know, eight, Germany. In your customer, in your record, they're not going to store the word Canada. They're going to store four. So suddenly, you know, we decide to rename Canada to Republic of Canada. We don't need to go through every student record and update the word Canada to Republic of Canada. We just change the description over here. And the foreign key is four, the primary key stays as four, but the name changed. That is a foreign key. That, that's how things get interconnected. And they are basically one or more fields in a child record that depends on a parent. It is, the, a foreign key's value is defined by a parent record's primary key. That is the end all be all 99% of the time answer. Because there's people that try to be special. Technically, it doesn't have to be the primary key of another table, but then you're doing something wrong if you're doing that. Yeah, if, if the child record must have a value in that field and it is a foreign key, then it is technically a, it can be both a strong and a weak entity at the same time. But it is going to be a weak entity because it cannot exist without a value coming from somewhere else. So if you have an address and you must have a, a province and that record cannot exist without the province being defined, technically, yes, that is a weak entity. The province table, on the other hand, is a strong entity. Because it exists onto itself. Wow. Technically, it's also a weak entity because it depends on a country. But you can see how it chains down, right? Where it's strong, but it's weak, but it's kind of weak and strong. It's like, you know, a Mormon relationship. Where everybody's related to everybody else. That's Kentucky, but anyways. Um, but essentially, yeah, so that's a weak entity, yes, in that sense. But essentially, a foreign key is an attribute that gets its value based normally on the primary key of another table. The values will cascade throughout the database downwards. Okay, now I'm going to start talking about the surrogate keys versus the natural keys. Now, I've already described what a composite key is. I've already described what a natural key is. This is a slide that I just threw in there in case I forgot something up till this point. A synthetic key, also known as a surrogate key, we covered that. I've already talked about all these. Good. Skip. But it's all your definitions in one place, so it's a good slide to have for your own reference. Now, depending on which side of the world you come from, and I don't mean, you know, Russia versus Canada here. I'm talking who taught you while you went to school. You will either have a, a, pre a preference for natural keys or a preference for synthetic keys or surrogate keys. And normally... The ones that have a preference for the natural keys are guys that were writing databases back in the COBOL days, right? The guys that were creating databases in the 60s, the 70s, and the early 80s. Because back then, generating values on the fly was expensive because computers were slow. In the mid-80s, computers became fast. Yeah, I know. My watch has more horsepower than some computers in the 80s. And mine's not even a smart watch. It's, you know, just a normal watch. But it's got computing capabilities, as in, you know, it's got a timer. And in the 80s, there was a paradigm shift where suddenly computers started picking up speed. This happened pretty much when the 8088 processors came out, 8086. You know, maybe some of you have heard the word 486. Those of you that are a certain age, the Pentiums. I know, we're feeling old now. Those that were smiling with me, and they're like, and nobody else is. Yeah, we're feeling old. 
But when those initial computers came out, they were insanely fast compared to the previous generation. And the problem is, is that because the, the circuitry got better. So using natural keys became kind of redundant because why would you use a natural key if you gave the computer to calculate what the next key is? So there are problems with natural keys. And there's a bunch of problems. Problem number one, the size. Circuit keys are usually integers. Integers are small, right? So with you know, one bit information, you can store zero or one. Two bits of information, you can get up to three. Four bits of information, you can get, to get up you know, to seven. So depending on how many bits you have, you can get lots more numbers. Integers are stored that way by flipping bits. They don't take up a lot of room. On the other hand, if you're using somebody's name as, their, as the primary key. Now, you know, if you have a Chinese name like Li Pu, L-I-P-U, hot damn, that takes up no room. Now, if you come from Puerto Rico, I'm pretty sure I don't have any Puerto Rican students this term, but Hispanic students know exactly what I'm talking about. You have four first names and a couple of last names and you might have two or three middle names. I wish I was kidding. I'm not. It's just, can you imagine, you know, if you're using that as your primary key, they're huge. And size cares. I mean, nowadays our hard drives are so big, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. But there was one, once was a point in time where hard drives were counted in megabytes, right? Not gigabytes or terabytes. Megabytes. And, you know, taking up 3K of space on that 200 megabyte hard drive just because you want to hold the person's name as your primary key is wasted space. Whereas you could use, you know, four bits to hold a number. Space. Foreign key size. If your primary key is big, guess what's going to happen to your foreign keys? They're going to be fat asses too. Whatever your primary key size is, your foreign key is going to be the same size. And if you're using it more than one place, you have a bunch of fat ass kids spread out through the system. They take up room. It's the exact same reason problem one exists. Foreign keys have the same issue. Aesthetics. Now, this one is an eye of the beholder thing. If you have a SIN number in the database and you have to look it up by SIN number every single time, some people will say, well, that's nice on the eye, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's a SIN number. Boop. That's easy to read. It's easy on the eye. It's easy to understand. Or some people like saying, again, the phone number, you know, 613-555-1212. That's easy on the eyes because it's something your brain grasps, as opposed to 56, 35, 533, some random number that means nothing. Some people prefer having compound primary keys just so that it's pretty. Yeah, it's not a good idea. They just take up room, just use a number. And then you've got what's called optionality and applica applicability. Surrogate keys don't have a problem with people or things not wanting to or not being able to provide the data. Okay, I like using this one as an example because let's just say you go and do, you apply for a store credit card. And the person at Walmart says, can I have your SIN number? By the way, never give them your SIN number. But they ask you for your SIN number so they can look you up to do a credit check, right? Did you know for most credit checks, you never need a person's SIN number? You just need an address and their name. And if you're starting up a record to open up a new credit card for the person and they don't want to give you your SIN number, the SIN number is optional. But if you're using that as your primary key, it's no longer optional. So the person has to give you their SIN number. And if they don't want to give you their SIN number, they're not going to be a customer. Chicken before the egg, right? On the other hand, if you have a surrogate key, they say, I don't want to give you a SIN number. No problem. I don't want the SIN number. You don't have to give me your SIN number. I'm okay with that. I respect your privacy. And therefore, the storage key doesn't care because it doesn't care about what's happening outside the database because it's happy in its own little world. 
As I said, there's a lot of problems with natural keys. Two whole slides of them. Uniqueness. Surrogate keys are guaranteed to be 100% unique because they're given out once. And that's a relief because SIN numbers can conflict. The British NINs have the same number of digits as a Canadian SIN number, and they look pretty much the same, last I heard. If I remember, the British NINs are, are nine digits. No, it's not the British NINs, it's the Irish NINs are nine digits. The same number of, basically their, their identifier numbers look the same, exactly the same as ours. You can't tell them apart. So if you use that as your, as your identifier, you're screwed because you might actually have two people with the same number going into the system. Privacy. Natural keys. Remember I was talking about the SIN number at the cashier, Walmart, when she wants you to apply for your Walmart card? There's, there's you know, synthetic keys don't have privacy concerns because they have no meaning outside the, outside the database. Um, accidental denormalization. That's not something you really need to worry about later till later, if you don't understand what normalization is till, you know, so there's no point in trying to explain that one. But essentially, you can't break it down by accident. Or you can't make it bigger by accident either because it's an surrogate key would be self-contained. A natural key, on the other hand, can be accidentally broken down. Uh, same thing with cascading updates. Surrogate keys don't change. On the other hand, if anybody's ever had their identity stolen and you have to get a new SIN number from the Canadian government and you go to a bank that's using your SIN number as your primary key and they need to update all the records with your primary, with your SIN number, there's going to be cascading updates that roll down having to update all the records that match your SIN number. And some systems don't like doing that. Just putting it out there really doesn't like it. <laughs> Actual fact, what they'll do is they'll create a new customer record and then transfer everything over to that one instead of actually changing your SIN number. At least that's what BMO, CIBC, and Scotiabank do. Not sure if TD does that, but TB, TD's bank system is even older than those, is even stupider than those first three banks, so I'm guessing theirs is the same story. So cascading updates are bad with natural keys because, you know, natural keys can change. If it exists out in the real world, nothing is permanent. And if you're using strings, Strings are slow. In other words, if you are comparing a person's last name, not only if you go with my last name, you've got to compare the G, the A, the U, the D, the R. And it literally starts with the first one. It goes, give me everybody that starts with G. And I was going to say, okay, now give me everybody that starts with G, A. And then everybody that starts with G, A, U. String matches are slow. And the other one says, give me everybody that's 455. Done. Why? Because it's only a number. There's no you know, trying to figure out where it fits into the grand scheme of things because it's a number. Numbers don't change. Now, surrogate keys do have their own issues depending on who you want to ask. Um, the first issue is getting the next value. The old time database guys used to bitch about this all the time. Oh, it takes forever to get the next value. No, it doesn't. They're full of it. Servers do it automatically. You set it up in Postgres as a big serial. In MySQL, set it up as auto increment. Microsoft just SQL Server, you set it up as an identif uh, identifier, if I remember right. And Oracle's just special. But they all do it automatically. That's, the, that's an excuse. Users don't understand synthetic keys or surrogate keys. They go, your number is 52. Why am I 52? Who cares? You're 52. Shut up. It is what it is. I mean, how many people here have gone to like uh, the MTO office on Walkley recently? You know, and you go and you get your next number. You're now number 505. They're now serving 23. You know, but you've been given a number. Who cares what that number is? If they're using that number to identify you while you're there. Users don't understand surrogate keys. Again, who cares? Do you understand what your student number means? No. Do you care? No. It's a number. And a story. Extra joins. Technically, yes. That could be an issue. 
That means if you're using a natural keys, in other words, you're using a person's SIN number and their last name, and you want to go find some records related to them, you can just type in their SIN number and their last name right in the child record. It'll come up right away. But when you're using surrogate keys, you've got to go find the parent record first and then pull the child records. You have to do one extra connection. Yay. The end user never notices it. It's the software developers that hate you for it. And as a person that both designs and develops, I hate myself all the time. So, you know, you just learn to suck it up. Extra indexes. Technically, that's the other bad thing is it takes up a little more room on the disk. If you've got, if you're using natural keys, odds are that field would be indexed anyways in the serve in the service system. I'll explain later in the term what indexes are, but they're a structure that makes things go faster, let's say. If you're using surrogate keys, that means you're going to have one more. In other words, you're going to have the index on the surrogate key plus anything else you would have indexed. If you don't have a surrogate key, when you use natural keys, then you're only going to have those things you would have indexed. So you're adding one little extra structure to make things go faster. Again, it's a non-issue. Might have been an issue back when we had tape to tape. When I watched the old movies and they got the tapes going. Even nowadays, people are going to look at me and go, what do you mean movies with tapes? You know, there once was a time where we had tapes, where data was stored on tapes. And, you know, that little bit of room counted for a lot. Because the more you had to move the tape, the slower your access was. People don't think about those implications, you know. I, I missed the tapes. I never had to deal with the tapes. It was before my time. All right. Now that I've spent time talking about attributes, what time is it? Okay. I got six slides left. I think I can finish this in the next 15 minutes. So let's go for it, guys. I was debating about two slides ago whether I was going to give you guys a break or not, and I'm like, oh, eight slides left. Just keep going. Power through it. So relationships. A relationship is a connection between entities. In other words, a relationship would be teacher to course, sorry, teacher to course section, student to course section. That's a relationship. Parents with children, there's a relationship. Um, student and their grades, those are relationships. Those are the connections between things of information. Slap them next time he talks. I allow students to hit each other in my class. So relationships allow you to organize your data structure. In other words, instead of having everything in one big giant bin, you have everything in small bins that are nicely interconnected cleanly. Um, for example, I hate talking about Java because I don't program in Java. But normally, anybody here program in PHP so I can use that as an example or any scripting languages ever? Okay. You know when you write your code, you've got two ways you can write your code, right? You can write your code in a bunch of small files that are imported in or included, or you write everything in one big giant file. Which one do you think is easier to work with? The small files, because if you've got a bug, you're only looking at a small chunk of code instead of you know, 10,000 lines of code. Technically, they will perform at the same speed. Which one's harder to work with? You break it down. Therefore, when you're designing your database, you want to break things down to the smallest component pieces that make sense so that the data only changes in one place and you use relationships to interconnect everything. Now, the most common relationship type is one to many. So 99% of the relationships you'll create in a database is one to many. In other words, a mother can have many children. A child can only ever have one mother. Well, one biological mother. Let's not talk about complicated situations. Right? I mean, they could have a mother and a unicorn. Take your pick. I don't care. But biologically, that child will have one physical mother. That kid came out of one person. So that mother can have many kids. But each kid can only ever come from one mother. That's one to many. Another example would be um, a, a teacher and course sections. As a teacher, I can have many course sections. 
For example, this term I have five. Four for this group and one from another. But each of those sections can only ever have one teacher. So I have one of me, many sections. Each section belongs only to one teacher at a time. One to many. Teacher to student. I have many students. You guys have one 8215 prof. So one to many, many to one. That's the easy one to understand too. Many to many. This is the, uh, the Kentucky hillbilly relationship where everything is related to everything else. Physically impossible in modern relational databases. There are database servers out there that allow this to happen. So what happens is you have two or more tables related to each other more than once. That's why I call it a Kentucky relationship, right? Uncle, cousin, dad. Then ling, 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 ling. For the ones that didn't get the joke till I did the banjo sound, right? So for example, you can have two tables that are interconnected to each other. And it is almost impossible to maintain because after a while, you don't know what's interconnected to what anymore because it's a big giant spider web of connections. And they did create something to avoid having to create these. They're known as associative entities. They used to be also be known as has and belongs to many entities. Basically put, you create a third entity and it inherits from both parents. So instead of the parents going like this, the parents are going like this. So this is complicated. This is simple. So this one down here can't exist unless both of here exist. But these guys can exist with or without each other. And so the associative entity is designed to bridge two or more tables. That's its purpose in life is to connect more than two, ta two or more tables. And I, I, here's where I use an anecdote. Years ago, when I first started working at digital, now many of you in here don't know who digital equipment is. They got bought by Compaq and then they merged with HP. I was there for the whole thing. I inherited this database system, which was designed by someone that knew nothing about database design. And there was this one table that was related to another table that was related to the first table. And one day they said, well, you know, there's a bunch of records in there we don't need. Dan, can you just get rid of those? So me being I am smart, made a backup that day. That's actually rarely I do backups because I'm so confident in my skills. But I made a backup that day because I had a bad feeling what was going to happen. And then I found the one record where I thought, oh, this seems to be the, you know, the bottom of the chain. I deleted that record. And then the server was grinding for th three minutes. Usually a delete takes a fraction of a second, like a thousandth of a second. I'm like, hmm, I wonder what's going on. Not being very smart. So you notice I said, I am smart. I got up and got a cup of coffee, came back, and it was still grinding. I'm like, oh, something's really not good now. I wonder if the server just crashed. So I stopped the service, restarted the service, I loaded the database table, and the table was empty, except for two records. Because everything was connected to everything else, after I started deleting, it started cascade deleting all the child records. You know that whole, you know, if you could go back in, in time and kill your grandfather, would you exist? Well, I discovered the answer is nobody exists. Because I killed a child and it didn't delete the grandparent. Somehow it managed to climb back up to the top and start genociding the whole family all over again. <laughs> so many to many, you don't create. They, it exists on the conceptual stage as in, you know, a teacher can have many students, a t students can have many teachers. However, we created something called course sections so we can connect the teachers and the students in the same manner. Right, so each of you are connected to a course section, each teacher is connected to a course section, and thus you have more than one teacher, and each teacher has more than one student via the course section. That is the associative entity that connects teachers to students. Don't ever create many to many in a physical. I will take points away and laugh at you. <laughs> Last time I saw one of those, I actually got up, went to my bar, and got myself a beer and sat down because I couldn't contain myself was so bad. It's not cool when you make your teachers drink. Now, the other kind is one-to-one. -one. 
These are very rare. They are, they are what they call edge case relationships. They're used just for specific purposes. One is used to divide really large tables. And by today's database server standards, this is just an excuse. But there once was a time where you could only have so many fields in the table. Um, anybody, oh God, here I'm gonna age myself. Anybody here remember DBase? Does that ring a bell for anyone in this room? A little bit, okay. Well, DBase allowed 100 fields per table. Once you went over 100, you had to create another table and you had a one-to-one -one relationship between the two, which meant a record in table two couldn't exist without a record in table one, but there could never be more than one in each. It just keeps adding. It's sort of like your, you know, your dining room is not big enough, so you add another five feet to your dining room, but you never actually take out the wall. You just you know, notch out a little hole so you can pass the food in and out. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, another reason which is slightly more valid is to isolate part of the original table for security reasons. So let's just say you have a table and this table also contains sensitive information such as SIN numbers, username, passwords, that kind of stuff. You may actually take that information, put it in another table, lock down behind tighter security so that you have the person's basic information here, but not everybody can go diving into this one or you need to encrypt part of this information. Nowadays, encrypting your data is a very important thing because, you know, how many, how many data leaks have been there been in the last three weeks? Another five from random people? There's like a data we leak a week. And I don't remember which ones it was this time because, I mean, they've all leaked now pretty much. And that's another reason you can actually split the table and encrypt part of it. Or you can store short-term data that's okay to delete. So this would be session information. Oh, they logged in, and right now they're searching for this product, on, you know, and you want to keep track of what their last search was. That would be a one-to-one -one relationship where stuff changes occasionally. And you may have that on faster storage, but it's still a one-to-one -one relationship. It's just having to be stored somewhere else. Or, which again, user profiles, you just store part of the information and separate it. Honestly, there's no reason to do that, but some people justify it because they just want to justify using a one-to-one -one relationship at least once in their life. But that's, you know. Now, relationships number five. There's two magic words when we talk about relationships. Cardinality and optionality. Cardinality means how many. This means zero, one, or more. I forgot the word zero on my slide. And every term I say I got to put the word zero and I forget to do it. The slide's been like this for four years. Zero, one, or more. That means when you th I think about it as really, as a teacher, I have zero, one, or more sections. If I just got hired, I may not have any sections at all. Thus, I have a zero. I might just have one, or I might have more than one. Like I said earlier, I've got five. Same thing with you guys. You may have zero, one, or more courses. You just signed up to the school. They haven't assigned any courses to you yet. Therefore, you have zero courses. Maybe you're coming back this term to get your database credit and you have no other courses. Insert reason here why you'd only be here for one course, but it happens. Therefore, you have one. Or like the majority of you have more than one course section assigned to you. That's, that's the cardinality, zero, one, or more. And in a couple of terms, I'll be explaining the symbols that, that describe this. The optionality means, must it, ex must it have a value or not? So, when you place an order, when you place an order, can you place an order without a customer? Can you place an order in Amazon without being a customer. As in, you get to the end, you check out, and I want my shit tomorrow because I got Prime. You cannot hit checkout until you have a customer because they don't know where to send it to. They don't know, you know any of that information. An order cannot exist without a customer because you don't know who you sold it to. So that is optionality. On the other hand, a customer can exist without an order. You just registered yourself in the system, you're now a customer, but you haven't bought anything. <coughs> Technically, you've got an exi existential issue here, as in, are you a customer if you didn't buy anything? But, you know, you can register as a customer. 
You exist, but you can exist without an order, but the orders cannot exist without you. That's the, the optionality. Is, it, is the data optional or not in the relationship? Okay. All right, I'll cover this now. Um, I always debate when I'm going to cover this, but I'll do it now. Naming conventions. Now, this is totally unrelated to anything else we just finished talking about, which is why I always debate when I'm going to cover it, but I, try, I cover it as early as possible. There's this second last slide. Naming conventions. Naming conventions are an important thing. It's important to know what to call things. Now, you know when you're in Java, you've probably already had the, 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 the talk about how you name variables, what they should look like, what your classes should look like. Yeah? Well, this exists in database land too. The problem is that years ago, this was loose and free. People called their shit anything they wanted. You never knew what they were going to call their stuff. Even if you had two guys working on the same database, things weren't called the same. It was bad. And because you, once upon a time, we didn't have a lot of room, naming things used to be really damn cryptic. You wouldn't have customer, it might just be cust, or even better, C. C. O for order. L for order lines. What does L stand for? I have no idea. Lo logo? I don't know. But we had, so things were really, really cryptic. And I inherited a database like that once also where the guy got fired and he took his documentation with him. And his entire database, tables went from A, B, C, D. They had no meaning to the real world. And the fields were A1, A2, A3. Because he was saving space, also known as job security, until they got tired of, you know, him. Because he was as special outside of that as he was in his design. And, you know, that's terrible because you don't know what anything. It took me six months to figure out what the contents of the database was. Literally, that was my job for six months staring this. If I ever saw that guy in, in person, I probably would have beaten him to death. But just saying, you know, things were cryptic back then. Each company had its own standard. You go work for company A, they tell you name things like this. You go to work for company B, and they're like the opposite of company A. Everybody had their own way of doing things. It's still like that a little bit, but it's gotten a lot better. That would cause all kinds of grief because you'd go from one place to the other, or you worked on the database for a while, and then you go work somewhere else, and somebody else takes over the database, and they make their changes to it. Then you come back and you go, what the hell were they on? No, why does this not look like anything else in this database? Because they decided to do what they understood as their standards. Now, thanks to modern developer frameworks, something called the de facto standard has started to emerge. A, a de facto standard is a standard that's being generally accepted by the wide, most of the population, but nobody's written it down as an official standard. So, you know, you hear about ISO standard this, or you got... Um, you know, HTML4, HTML5, kind of, XHTML, XML, those are all standards. They're defined, written on paper, these are how it works. A de facto standard is most people have come to accept that this is how it should be done, and nobody's actually written down as a formal rule yet. And it probably never will be because in database land, people like to argue what things should be called. However, in my class, you will follow the following naming convention. This is a naming convention that's become almost the de facto standard in the industry as far as database design behind web development. Because something called frameworks came out to the party years ago. And there was one framework that started it all. And the standard almost follows that one's framework rules to the letter. It was called Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails came out to the party. And everybody said, Holy shit, Rails is great. What the hell's wrong with Ruby? So they took the concept and applied it to every other web programming language, and Ruby died. If you already wrote your program in Ruby, you're still writing it in Ruby. If you start a new project, it's not going to be written in Ruby. Poor Shopify. They're the biggest Ruby user on Earth right now. Just saying. So, you know, the standard came out in PHP. You got Cake PHP and Laravel. They have almost the exact same standard. Code Igniter. Kohana, they all have the same standards. They all follow roughly these rules with a few tiny little differences. Number one, everything is lowercase. 
No exception. Nothing mixed case ever will cross my desk. Why is everything lowercase? Because database servers lie. Postgres is case sensitive just like it's Unix and Linux is. Why? Because it was created on Unix originally. It was case sensitive there, so they kept it being case sensitive. Microsoft SQL Server is case sensitive depending what language you have it installed under. If you have it installed in English, it's case sensitive. If you have it installed in Cyrillic, guess what? It's not case sensitive because Cyrillic's not case sensitive. Everything's uppercase in Cyrillic. Go figure. Oracle lies because it lets you put it in every which way you want, but it then it stores an uppercase version somewhere in the system. So, you know, the word tie with capital T-I-E or capital lowercase t, uppercase I, the system treats it all as the same thing because it just looks up for the uppercase name instead. It just lies to you. Saying, oh, you can call it whatever you want, but really, it's going to be called this. Everything is lowercase. That way it's going to work everywhere, regardless. There's no spaces ever. Spaces are evil. Because the SQL language uses spaces to delimit words and commands. So if you put a space in your object name, guess what's going to happen? It's going to think you're issuing two different commands. That otherwise, you have to start escaping it, escaping your, 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 your string. So if you put in Dan Goudreau with a space in it as a field name, I don't know what you call a field name after my name, but you put a space in there. Hold on up. I know you're about to ask a question. You end up having to escape it. Now, here's the fun part. In MySQL, an escape is a back tick. If you don't know what that is, it's the character above your tab key, below the, til the tilde, and the backtick. And you didn't know what those two things were called? That's a tilde and a backtick. Postgres uses double quotes. Microsoft products use square brackets. Every server escapes differently. That means if you use spaces, your code won't be portable because you're going to have to handle every database server. What was your question? What does the first row say? There. I already answered your question. It was in writing at that. Tables are plural whenever possible because that table contains a collection of information all related. Therefore, if you have a table called orders, it contains a bunch of orders. This is where people argue the database land, the, the plural versus the singular on the entity names. For my case, I use plural because it just so happens that's the, the way I'm used to seeing it. Therefore, that's what we're going to use is plural. There are exceptions to the rule. If you have a word that implies plurality, such as inventory, inventory implies the count of many different things. A log, captain's log, right? They have a log, but that log has many entries. It implies plurality because that's what it is by nature. It's a plural thing. Those don't have to be plural, but pretty much everything else would be. And one of the worst ones that has to deal with this is people versus person. Let's think about this for a second, right? People can be a plural of person, but technically people can also be pluralized because you've got peoples. What are the peoples of Canada? You've got the Native Americans, you've got the Inuit, you've got, you know, the invaders, right? So, you know, we've we got three separate sets of peoples here, at least, and then you've got, you know, the people that have immigrated here over the years. So you keep, if you start adding up all the different peoples in Canada, you know, you've got multiple kinds of people. Same thing, you've got a person. If you have more than one person, you have several persons. Do you ever hear the phrase, persons of interest? You know, hey, look, there's another shooting at South Keys. We have persons of interest in custody. Well, hey, for those of you that aren't from around here, don't get the joke. For those of you around here really get the joke. Or there was another shooting on Ritchie. There's persons of interest at large. Yeah. So, but that's a case where the word person is pluralized. So person and people is the worst one. So you tend to want to pick the one that applies as close as possible. And you just accept it for what it is. Um, primary keys are always called ID. And that way you never need to guess what it's called. 
So if it's ID, no matter how, if the table is called persons, and there's a column called ID, you know that's the ID of a person. This is one that used to be common that you'd use the whole table name in front of it. So if you had a table called customer called details, the primary could be called customer called details ID. Holy crap, that sucks to type in as a programmer. So then they'd get, when they go, CCD ID, right? Customer call details ID, because it's too long to get the programs to type that in all the time. So suddenly you know, you're guessing what the primary keys are called. Unless they've got a diagram or you know a field listing that identifies what everything is, they're screwed because they're going to be guessing random letters until they get it right. And as a developer, you don't always get to see the database. You may get to see a list of the fields that apply to you, and that's all you get to play with in a larger organization. So always call the primary keys ID. That way you never need to guess what your primary keys are called. They're always ID. The foreign keys have a naming rule. And it is the singular parent table name followed by an underscore, followed by the primary key name. So for example, if we have a parent table called persons and its primary key is called ID, the foreign key would be called person underscore ID, the singular version of the parent table name underscore ID, which is the primary key. Now, can you imagine if we were using the long one? So it would be person underscore CCC ID. You had no idea what that would be because it'd be hard to read. But if you follow this rule, for example, I, the one I use on here is users. A users table, it contains individual user records. Primary key is ID. Therefore, the foreign key would be user ID. And if I can bring my mouse back to life here, this is the ID of a user that we find in the users table. With this naming convention, you never need to guess what the parent table is. You never need to guess what the parent's primary key is because the naming convention of the child, the foreign key tells you everything you need to know to go up the, climb up the tree. Okay. Now, don't take, hold on, don't start throwing shit around yet. Just got to get a few announcements out of the way. Lab 2 is due Thursday by 7.30. Okay. You should be starting to work on Lab 3. This set of slides applies to Lab 3. That's why it's important to have this lecture before you start Lab 3. Lab 3 is a quiz. You can take it as many times as you want. There's no submission other than when you get to the end, you go submit, and then you're done. Ta-da. Hey, well, I'll be there. I don't get paid if I don't go there. So I will be there. If you come, great. If you want to come and shoot the shit and play video games, that's good too. Just don't be loud. So that, that is that. Um, there is recommended reading. I'll post it in the announcement. And... Next week, the lecture should be shorter. <laughs>